I'll stay in your rest. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, it would be it would be nice to know which hyperservices, uh, which let's say smooth hyperservices in projective space, um, are rational, um, and in a way the most general result about that is this one by um, Kohler um, from around uh, 1995. Um, that's um, for any um, number n at least three and any um, integer d at least uh, two times n plus two over uh, n plus three over three rounded up. Uh, so roughly two thirds of n. Um, a very general um, hypersurface of degree d um, in Pn plus 1 um, is not rational. Well, let's say is not ruled, and hence, um, so I'm thinking about, let's say, complex hypersurfaces for the statement. Um, a very general one of these, this degree is not ruled, and hence, um, is not rational. Okay. Um, right, and so for, for lower degrees, um, almost nothing is known about uh, rationality. I mean, this has been discussed in other talks, but, um, but just um, to, to quickly remind you of the situation in lower degrees, um, so, you know, there are some example, I mean, of course, uh, quadric hyperservices are over the complex numbers are rational. Um, there are some uh, cubics um, of even dimensions um, that are rational, um, let's say smooth uh, cubics. Um, uh, yeah, so for example, you, you show that all cubic surfaces are rational by finding that they contain two uh, disjoint lines and, and drawing uh, lines, well, drawing uh, lines connecting this pair of lines to show that any um, cubic surface uh, is rational. And the same argument shows that a cubic fourfold that contains two disjoint planes is rational. Um, but that's just a special class of cubics. Uh, and um, there is no known example um, of a hypersurface, uh, let's say, a smooth hypersurface um, of any degree at least four uh, of any dimension, uh, uh, which is rational. I think I'm stating that correctly. So, um, right. So maybe the most plausible guess is that all smooth hypersurfaces of degree at least four are not rational, um, but nobody knows. And, and Kohler's statement is, is more or less the uh, strongest known result. In a few low-dimensional cases, um, more is known. Like there's the case of cubic threefolds that doesn't fit into this. Uh, the case of um, I guess quintic fourfolds doesn't fit into this. Th those are, are non-rational by Puklikov. Okay, um, so let's see. Um, all right, ruled. I mean, in this situation, maybe uh, just to, to be clear, a variety is um, ruled if it's birational. Um, so I mean, to um, to s some product of another variety with with P one. Okay. Um, so, yeah. What's the, what's known about unirational? In, are there some unirational things known? Yeah, yeah, that's closer right. To that? right. Right. So, so uh, basically, in, in short, low degree hypersurfaces um, are known to be unirational. I guess I should say maybe something like very low degree. So something like if, if d is the most, I don't know what the number is, but something like the square root of n or something like that, then hypersurfaces of such a low degree are unirational. So probably. Uh, in this range, uh, I would expect that these hypersurfaces are not unirational, but that's not known. 
Oh, of course, I should say maybe that there's this sort of very easy case, which should be mentioned that, of course. Uh, okay. see if, yeah. um, uh, in the, the, the Collar doesn't, and does yeah. he, doesn't he say that uh, his varieties are not, uh, for example, they, they, could not, they are not also um, conic bundles, no? Oh, it's a different uh, aspect. I think. He said that he cannot be fibers into rational curves. Right, I guess. I mean, I think, but maybe you, you need to make a. If you make stronger assumption on D, D at least about three fourths of n, then you're right. Then he could show that it's not even birational to a, a conic bundle, and more along those lines. But yeah, <coughs> with, with slightly stronger assumptions, with stronger assumptions on D. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, just just I mean, so an easy case which just should be mentioned is that if um, D is at least n plus one, uh, or let's see, am I saying this right? If D is at least n plus two. Um, then you know every smooth hypersurface um, of degree uh, d in p n plus one. Um, well, one way to say it is that it has uh, non-zero sections of the canonical bundle, non-zero top degree differential forms, um, and so it's it's not um, it, it's not even say. Uh, Stably rational or unirational, um, but it's not even rationally connected. I'm sorry. Um, so, and in high degree hypersurfaces, there's a severe shortage of rational curves. So those those hypersurfaces are very different from um, from these low degree ones. But but in any smaller degree, these the Fano hypersurfaces are rationally connected, uh, which makes this kind of uh, result not so obvious. Um, right, okay, so how does he prove that? Um, so it's by uh, degeneration to characteristic two. Um, so proof, um, sketch. Um, so suppose, um, first of all, that, that the degree D is even works more easily in that case. And I, I won't discuss what you have to do to, uh, to deal with odd degree cases. Um, uh, so it's just sort of a further degeneration argument to deal with the odd degree case. Um, okay. um, so the, uh, the good thing about hypersurfaces of even degree is that they degenerate to um, double covers of some other hypersurfaces. Um, so for the most famous example, uh, quartic curves in P3 are, are smooth curves of genus 3. They're not hyperelliptic, but they do um, you can sort of degenerate them to smooth hyperelliptic curves, to smooth double covers of P1. Uh, and something similar happens here. Um, then it's a sort of old observation that hypersurfaces of degree uh, D, which is 2A, uh, degenerate or can degenerate to um, two double covers of um, hypersurfaces of degree. Um, of degree A. Um, and you can write down explicit um, formulas for that uh, digit generation. I, you mean, right? Yeah, right, right. Sorry. Um, ramified double covers. If you, um, so let's see. I mean, it's easy enough to write down the formulas. Um, but, so the way I did this, uh, so an explicit formula is that in uh, weighted projective space um, P of 1 to n plus 2 comma a. Um, so projective space where the variables are called uh, x, not through xn and one extra variable of degree uh, a. Um, I consider the, um, let's see, consider this, let's say, over a discrete valuation ring R with um, uniformizer so I'm going to, in order to write down a, uh, a degeneration, a one-parameter family of varieties, I'll think of that as a, a family of variety, a scheme over R. Um, so in that weighted projective space, consider the um, weighted complete intersection. Um, I just want to write down these few equations because they are simple enough. Um, so y squared equals f and um, g equals t times y, where 
I guess g f here is some homogeneous polynomial of degree 2a in, the, in these x variables. Um, and g is a homogeneous variable of degree a, again, in the x variables. Um, right. Then the thing is, this is sort of easy enough to analyze. I'm sort of writing down a, a one parameter uh, family of varieties over the spectrum of this ring. Um, what you find is that sort of um, so over the generic point of spec R, um, so where t is not equal to zero, t is like a, a function on this um, on this one-dimensional scheme. Um, you can solve for y in terms of g, and so this thing, um, this, uh, this complete intersection, maybe should have a name like script x. Um, so th the generic fiber uh, x uh, is is just a hypersurface. It's isomorphic to the hypersurface. Probably, uh, I don't know. Sorry. Well, I was going to say it, the hypersurface um, g squared minus t squared f which is some hypersurface of degree 2a in projective space. Um, and where t is equal to 0, um, the special fiber y um, is it's a double cover. You know, y squared equals um, f. I guess it's a double cover of the hypersurface g equals 0. So which, again, is just uh, in uh, Pn plus 1 again, uh, but, but sort of over the residue field of that ring. Anyway, so it's just easy to write down such a degeneration. Um, yes. OK, and Kolar's idea is that um, for this example, he wants to take um, R to be mixed characteristic where the residue field has characteristic 2. Um, so you could, you could do this degeneration in characteristic 0, but um, he uses this degeneration with um, residue field of R of characteristic 2. OK, and if you look at this de generation in that case, then um, this kind of equation behaves a bit differently than in characteristic 0. Um, this is, becomes an inseparable double cover. Um, so the special fiber is then an inseparable, um, meaning the derivative is 0 everywhere, uh, double cover. Of, of again, this hypersurface uh, of degree 2a. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a double cover of the hypersurface of degree a. OK. So, um, OK, so what good is that? Um, so, um, yeah, you can ask. Uh, for this important argument, it's going to be important to ask what sort of singularities y has. Um, you, you would like to take, say, f and g as general as possible. Um, so when you do that, this, this general fiber will be a smooth hypersurface of degree 2a. Um, but you can never arrange for this singular, the special fiber to be uh, smooth. It automatically, it will sort of more or less inevitably have some singularities. But they're, they're very mild. Um, so for f and g general under sort of very uh, mild assumptions, like that number a being at least 2 or something. I forget the number. Um, the, so the general fiber is smooth. Uh, in our case, I should have said that the fraction field of R should have characteristic 0. So, so x is a smooth hypersurface in characteristic 0. Um, and y has um, uh, approximately uh, nodes, almost the simplest possible type of singularities. Um, so let me describe more precisely. So the thing is that if n, the dimension of these, these two varieties both have dimension n, if that's even, then um, y has exactly nodes. Singularities of y are nodes. So um, in that dimension, they would be given a tall locally by an equation like this. Um, so the simplest um, quadratic form in characteristic 2. Um, this defines an n-dimensional um, uh, singular variety. With, yeah. And if n is odd, then the singularities of this double cover um, can't be quite that simple. Um, but they're 
um, almost as good. Singularities of y um, are. It's all locally with the form. Um, so the thing is, you're going to have this y squared in there. You would like to have only um, terms like that, but you're bound to have this y squared in there. But things are sort of as, as nice as they could be otherwise. What did I write down? Um, so y squared plus x1 cubed plus x2 x3 plus blah, 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 plus x n minus 1 x. Um, right, so this is, uh, whoops, sorry, <laughs> pretty nearly as simple as a node. So I haven't really got to the, you know, why degenerate to characteristic 2 in particular. Uh, it's this really remarkable feature of these singular varieties that you get. They're, they're basically singular Fano varieties, very, very mildly singular Fano varieties. Um, you can write down a resolution of singularities easily by just blowing up the points. Um, so, so we have a resolution of singularities y prime to y, just given by blowing up the singular points, it becomes smooth in one step. Um, and um, this sort of spectacular feature of this is that, um, that this uh, y prime, although it's a resolution of singularities of a Fano variety, has some non-zero differential forms on it. Um, so um, there's no way you could have top degree forms, n degree forms, because the, the canonical bundle of, of y prime is it's rather negative. It's not going to have any sections, but there are n minus 1 forms on this uh, thing. So this, um, let's just say this could never happen for, um, uh, for say, rationally connected varieties in characteristic 0. Um, and th these are rationally connected varieties. Um, the well, in a way to describe what's going on is that this variety y or y prime is is not separately rationally connected. Um, so here, y and equivalently y prime. Um, so it's this um, phenomenon that you know you can uh, you can get from any point to any other on these uh, varieties. By, by rational curves, but these rational curves, although in a sense they sort of move in a family that uh, goes all over the variety, um, the the derivative of that map doesn't sort of change in all possible directions. Um, it's uh, yeah, I mean it's basically because of the fact that you can have non-constant maps in characteristic p where the derivative is zero everywhere. So um, yeah, sort of if you had p ones with positive normal bundle, uh, this kind of thing would never happen, but it does happen. Um, oh, right, right. So, I mean, I can discuss a little bit about why this H0, you know, how Kolar computed that, that, uh, that there are differential forms on this variety in characteristic 2. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of basically just from staring at the equation of this sort of uh, double cover. Um, you know, y squared equals some um, polynomial together with uh, g equals 0. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so this double cover of the hypersurface G equals 0. Um, why, why does it have differential forms? Well, the, the sort of uh, one feature of this uh, variety is if you think about the tangent bundle of this variety, it is mostly smooth. There are a few singular points, but mostly it's smooth. Um, the tangent bundle comes with an obvious line bundle, which is sort of uh, if you change in the y direction, then you know this equation will still be true to first order. So somehow just... Uh, so there is an obvious line rank one subbundle, um, uh, say L inside the tangent bundle of Y. Let's say just looking at the smooth part of Y, um, and and this, oh sorry, corresponding to the Y direction in this equation, um, and this is a line subbundle of of rather high degree. It's a rather positive. Uh, uh, yeah, so which can be unexpectedly positive, <laughs> more positive than you would expect. 
Um, so, you know, Y is something like a Fano variety, so it's not surprising that there's some line bundle that's a bit positive, but this line bundle is more positive. You just compute its degree and so on, more positive than you would expect. Um, and a way to interpret that is, is saying that the tangent bundle of this uh, Fano variety is, is rather unstable. You know, um, it has sub bundles that have higher degree than you would expect. And Fano varieties in characteristic zero, the tangent bundle is never that unstable, never as unstable as happens in this case. Um, yeah, so, so I want to just sort of taking duals, you can interpret this in terms of the cotangent bundle. This means that the cotangent bundle of this variety Y is also rather unstable. Um, so say, again, just ignoring the singularities, which are not, in fact, a big issue here. Basically, the cotangent bundle of this variety is also um, rather unstable. When you take duals, this uh, line subbundle corresponds to a rank uh, n minus 1 subbundle, um, where this, um, this, is a, this is rank, it's a rank n minus 1 subbundle of uh, sort of unexpectedly uh, high degree. Being a bit vague about what I mean by uh, degree, but it's sort of more positive than than you would expect to have happening in there, um, and and so you know you might ask, are there actual one forms on this variety? And uh, the answer is nobody knows. Nobody has even tried to compute. But but fortunately, uh, from this uh, description, if you look at the uh, n minus first exterior power of this, you can see that that's going to contain the determinant of this and. And line bundles are easier to deal with. You know, so, so basically, the determinant of E sits inside omega n minus 1. Um, and you can just compute what the, that is. Uh, um, this, I mean, Kolar does compute this. That's something like um, O of uh, n plus 3, <laughs> minus 3a, or something like that. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, I don't know. Uh, sorry, the other way around. 3a, um, 3a minus n minus 2, uh, sort of restricted to this variety y. Yeah. Uh, y is sort of mapping to, to it's a double cover of hypersurface in projective space. So you pull back O of 1, and that's the line bundle I mean there. OK, uh, right. So that means that if, if A is big enough, which just means if the degree of our hypersurface is big enough, then you will have some, you know, You'll have some non-zero sections of this line bundle, so you'll have some non-zero sections, some non-zero n minus one forms on this um, this uh, double cover y for its resolution. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Um. Right. So. So that's, uh, yes, where this uh, strange differential form comes from. Um, OK, and uh, right, so, so the way Kolar's argument went was, um, well, you know, just from having some non-zero n minus 1 forms, that certainly implies that this uh, variety y prime is not rational, because um, spaces of differential forms are, are birational invariant. It's, it's rather easy to see. You can pull them back by, by rational maps. Um, so sort of. Uh, so for a at least uh, n plus two over three, um, you know, y is not separately rationally connected, so not uh, rational. Um, but uh, but Kolar's game was to prove that varieties in hypersurfaces and characteristic zero are not rational, and it's not clear how rationality behaves in families. So if you have a family of varieties where as, as here, we, where the singular the special fiber, in this case in characteristic 2, is, is not rational. You would sort of expect that the general fiber is not rational, but that's not um, immediately clear. I'll, I'll say more about how rationality behaves in families. Um, so Kohler's argument went slightly differently. Um, Kohler assumed a bit more that the number a is at least n plus 3 over 3. Um, so you have this is, this is a strictly positive line bundle then, if I'm saying things correctly. Um, so omega n minus 1 of y contains or a resolution, I'm being a bit sloppy, 
contains uh, an ample line subbundle, not just a trivial bundle. Um, and from there, it, it, it wasn't hard for him to check that, uh, that y is actually not ruled. Yes, right, right. You would just you would not have that. In. So what is that? What is it? Oh, so it's just uh, you just look at the equation of this thing. If you if you if you keep all the x coordinates the same and you change your y coordinate a little bit infinitesimally, uh -huh. then this equation will still be true. So it's, it's the vertical direction, it's the y direction. Uh, yeah, so it's the fact that y squared has derivative 0, which is uh, convenient, yeah. Um, right, okay. So this thing is not ruled. Okay, and the thing is that ruledness behaves well in families. This is a result by um, Matsusaka, you know. So if um, you have a family of varieties, even in mixed characteristic, um, where, say, one fiber, special fiber, um, is not ruled, then, then the uh, geometric generic fiber uh, is not ruled. I'm thinking about sort of um, how things behave over algebraically closed fields. So if, if one fiber is not geometrically ruled, then um, the, let's say, geometric uh, generic fiber is not, um, is not ruled. OK, and that's how you prove, that's how Kohler proved that these Sort of most hypersurfaces in character zero under this degree assumption are not ruled, and hence they're not rational. Um, okay. No, you get something worse, I guess. So, so yes, um, you could you could run this construction with uh, degenerations to characteristic p for any prime number p you want. So let me sort of spell out what would happen then. Um, so basically, sort of degeneration to characteristic p um, would prove the same non-rationality, um, but for sort of fewer degrees um, for hypersurfaces for general hypersurfaces of degree um, at least uh, roughly p over p plus one times n approximately. You know, so you would sort of you just we get for a certain range of rather high degree hypersurfaces, um, yeah. You, you well, you could prove that they're also non-rational. I mean, uh, but as as Claire said, you do get some sort of different information in this higher range of degrees. Like maybe you can show not just that these hypersurfaces are not rational, but they're that they're not uh, birational to any conic bundle, or you know, sort of the higher degree assumption you make, the more you can prove by this argument. Only for the degrees. Oh no, I didn't. I mean, I, let's just say let's let's uh, skip it. You know, basically, odd degrees, uh, have the odd degree of de degree one higher sort of degenerated to, you know, an even degree thing plus a hypersurface uh, plus a hyperplane, and and fortunately that kind of thing uh, works. So I, I would like to ignore that issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe sort of one thing that I'd like to discuss is um, what this what this very general means in the conclusion. Uh, is there some way to sort of, sort of concretely? So that means that we're throwing out countably many uh, subsets of the space of hypersurfaces. Uh, is there a way to be <laughs> more specific about what's involved? And in a sense, there is a way to be more specific. This is sort of, um, sort of easy observations about uh, families of varieties, but maybe worth uh, saying. Um, what I'm saying is, has, is very rarely written anywhere, but there is. One reference, I found this paper by uh, Charles Vial called Algebraic Cycles and Vibrations, um, Lemma 2.1. Um, it's the kind of thing that everybody knows, but nobody um, writes down. Um, so let's see. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's the following observation that if you just have um, uh, let x be any family of varieties, um, there's really no point in being too specific about 
assumptions, it's a really general fact. So any sort of family of varieties, um, let's say, over the complex numbers, to be um, specific. OK, um, then mm, let's see. A very general uh, fiber of, of this map, uh, maybe pi, um, is isomorphic. Uh, as a scheme to um, the geometric generic fiber of this family. Mm. So the geometric generic fiber is just one object, right? It's x over the, I mean, so to speak, x, but the, the fibers of this map over um, the algebraic closure of the function field of B uh, as a scheme. So that means very general fibers are, are defined over different fields from this on the face of it. This is um, you know, here I mean actual fibers, divide, which are varieties over the complex numbers. This is a variety over some other algebraically closed field, but these things are all the same uh, via some very non-unique isomorphism from C uh, to to this uh, to this field. Of course, these things are isomorphic, just isomorphism fields. So that's a sort of bizarre statement because you know we tend to think of a family of varieties as <laughs> actually varying. But uh, in a sense, if you're willing to sort of, you know, apply weird non-continuous automorphisms of the complex numbers, then you know, almost all the fibers are actually the same thing, the same scheme, uh, viewed in different ways. Um, maybe let me just to indicate why this is. You might think about sort of a, think about a special case of um, the, like the universal family of elliptic curves, say. Um, uh, well, I mean, as schemes, I'm just saying, so that, you know, yeah, if you want. I mean, so, but, you know, the, the one thing is a scheme over this field, one thing is a scheme over this field. You can choose, I'm saying you can, there is an isomorphism between those two fields, so that, you know, the one scheme here is isomorphic to the other scheme there. Okay. Um, think about the family of, universal family of elliptic curves, I was going to say. Um, you know, so there's this one dimensional family of elliptic curves. Um, you know, the, Moduli space is approximately the affine line given by the J invariant, and you know the fact is that um, um, so if you know, I have two elliptic curves, um, they have they both have J invariants that are complex numbers, and if these are both transcendental, um, if they're both not in Q bar, then there's an isomorphism of the complex number, an automorphism of the complex numbers that moves the one and j variant to the other. That's the sort of thing that I'm using here. And so these two elliptic curves, although they look different, you know, are in a sense the same. Okay. Mm. Then e1, e1 over c, and e2 over c are isomorphic as schemes. Let's say you could say by some automorphism of the complex numbers as a field. You can just move any transcendental number to any other and that's that's the same thing that's going on in this more general uh, lemma. Okay, so what does that tell you? Well, that means that sort of any property that you can state um, say of complex varieties that that only depends on the thing as a scheme or as a scheme over some unspecified field um, it has to, that such a property has to be the same for all varieties outside a countable set of varieties. Um, yeah, and you know, basically what, what's involved is just the number, the, the coefficients of the equations have to be independent enough. So, so for example, um, let's say, so let's say let B be the space of all hypersurfaces uh, of some degree D over in, in PM plus one. Um, so let S be the union of all um, all uh, sub varieties of B uh, defined over Q bar um, that are not equal to B. Just take that big union. It's a countable union of, of sub varieties of B. Then the complement of that is is the sort of uh, uh, set that I'm talking about here. So then, um, you know, all hypersurfaces, you know, corresponding to points of uh, B minus S, are um, 
isomorphic to each other as schemes. Um, they're isomorphic to the geometric generic fiber of this of the universal family of um, again, just emphasize not as schemes over C, but um, yeah. As sort of schemes over an unspecified field, they are all the same. And, and so for example, a property like being rational is just going to be the same for, for all the varieties in this family. So yeah, okay, so <laughs> that, that's a concrete way to say what very general means. You just exclude uh, this set of hypersurfaces and all the other ones, they act the same from the point of view of rationality or any other, uh, so to speak, algebra geometric property. Okay, oops, um, yeah, okay, okay. Um, right, so then I uh, wanted to uh, point out that this uh, Kohler's argument also proves non-stable rationality, um, so I'll see that next, um, so theorem that, um, if under the approximately the same assumptions, if n is at least three and d is at least two times um, n plus two over three, which is very slightly, uh, you know, I, before I had n plus three over three, so I'm covering a tiny bit more degrees than I did before, um, then a very general hypersurface of degree d um, n p n plus one, again, let's say over c. Um, is not uh, stably rational. Well, yeah, not it's not stably rational or re retract rational um, because um, it is uh, not uh, because chow zero of such a thing um, is not universally trivial. Okay. Um, so that's a property that sort of remains unchanged when you multiply by a higher dimensional projective space. Um, okay. So yeah, so, if, so for example, in particular this includes uh, the case of quartic threefolds, which Elena talked about. Okay. Right. Okay, so, um, yeah, so why is this? I mean, so uh, I'm already sort of hinting at the argument. So this is this argument about degenerating um, child groups of zero cycles. Um, let's see. So how do I say this? Um, OK, so basically, it, I guess it will suffice um, to show, uh, I guess, just two things that um, that Kohler's um, degeneration. These are these these uh, singular varieties in characteristic two. Uh, that that smooth hypersurfaces of again. Let's let's look at even degree. Um, so let's say let d equals two a, where a is at least now uh, n plus two over three rounded up. Um, right. So so hypersurfaces of this even degree degenerate to double covers of hypersurfaces of half that degree, you can consider those, um, that degeneration to characteristic two. Um, and I want to show these things satisfy two properties. Um, so one, that you can write down a resolution of singularities of those, they have these nodes or similar singularities, um, is, is uh, chow zero um, trivial, or I think it's called that, um, and two, um, that, uh, yeah, that sort of y prime has chow zero uh, not universally trivial. Okay, so, yeah, so then this uh, degeneration argument that Alana described, uh, so, so this is sort of saying that, you know, there is no decomposition of the diagonal for, for y prime, um, so that, that will then imply that, um, the sort of if you, that's general smooth hypersurfaces of degree two a in characteristic zero um, also have this property. So you could think about improving sort of that the geometric generic fiber of the family of all hypersurfaces in characteristic zero um, ha has this has property. Didn't 
Yeah, sure. So in characteristic zero, you had this universal Chow zero trivial. As Claire explained to us yesterday, that would imply there aren't any full forms. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Is that part? Is that going to be part of this story? I mean, it, uh, yeah, I can try to you know say something about why why there's a difference. Yeah, right. Okay, so uh, let's see. So, so uh, basically, one is just easy. Um, the exceptional divisors in um, its resolution of singularities are either um, are well, they're just projective quadrics. Um, if, if you write down the obvious resolution by blowing up singular points. Um, the, re the exceptional divisors are um, projective quadrics, um, which are smooth if n is um, even, and um, and they're, they're cones. They have one singular point um, uh, if n is odd. In both cases, um, it's easy to compute that, let's say, over an algebraically closed field, uh, these um, those those exceptional divisors have boring Chow zero groups, so that implies property one. Um, since these varieties have um, Chow zero universally trivial, that's what you need to check one. Um, okay. Yeah. Sure. Was there a cube in the odd equation? <laughs> there was a cube, but it doesn't uh, matter because when you blow up, sort of, you only see the lowest degree part of the equation. Um, the cube is kind of just there to make sure that uh, when you do that blow up, what you, what you get is something smooth. So it's a little bit weird to have a resolution where this is smooth or the exceptional divisor is singular, but that's what happens. Okay. Um, right. So two. Right. So the, the interesting part is two. Um, so two follows from some lemma like this that um, if you have any. Uh, let me just say smooth projective variety over some field. Um, um, that has some non-zero differential forms. Um, suppose that X, um, suppose that, yeah, there's some non-zero I forms on X for some positive uh, integer I, then chow zero of X um, is not universally trivial. So that's um, going to be the issue. Right. Um, yeah, so by the way, from that point of view, you can see why uh, I get this tiny improvement on, on uh, Kohler's result in the sense that, so for example, um, quartic, very, very general um, quartic fourfolds um, are not rational, um, or not even stably rational. So this is a case where even whether they were not rational, whether they were rational, was unknown um, because of that, that tiny improvement. And that tiny improvement comes because um, I'm not trying to produce an ample line bundle contained in, in, in this case, it would be omega n minus one. I just need some non-zero section of omega n minus one to to apply this conclusion. So in a sense, it's because Kohler had to prove more. He was trying to prove non-ruledness. Uh, this is more closer to just proving non-rationality. Okay, um, right. Okay, but yeah. So in that lemma, you can sort of say a little more about it, which sort of addresses Jason's question. Namely, uh, you 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 really get slightly different conclusions depending on the characteristic of the field there. So in fact, um, if k has characteristic zero, then um, Chow zero tensor Q is not universally trivial. So it's a kind of, it's a stronger conclusion in that. Way, um, and if um, the characteristic of the field is, is positive, um, then what you're really proving is that uh, Chow zero uh, mod p is not universally trivial. Um, okay, so maybe I should comment about uh, this. So, so the thing is that this um, this argument in characteristic zero. In some sense, well, it will, it will give you less uh, surprising 
information. Because, yeah, let me just make this remark that um, for any um, rationally connected variety, or, you know, I guess over any field, um, uh, Chow zero tensor Q just always is universally trivial. So you're not really going to get sort of subtle invariance uh, from that. Mm. Yes, I guess uh, Claire said something like this in her, her lecture yesterday. Um, I mean, there's different ways to, to say this, but basically, so one way, one argument for this is that if you, Chow zero tensor Q has a convenient property that it only gets bigger when you enlarge the uh, base field. So for fields um, K inside F, uh, Chow zero of X over one field injects into Chow zero of X over a bigger field with rational coefficients. Um, so to prove that Chow zero tensor Q is universally trivial because of this injectivity, it's enough to prove it for when you enlarge to an algebraically closed field. You know, if you do that, then it applies it for every field. And um, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I should say um, people use different notions of universally trivial. I, I'm thinking of the notion that the child group of zero cycles is the same for all extension fields. It's always Z, or in this case, Q, um, for all extension fields. So the point is, with Q coefficients, it's enough to check this for algebraically closed fields. And that's true just because on a rationally connected variety over an algebraically closed field, you can connect any two points by a rational curve. So that proves that Chow zero is boring. Somehow, right. Yeah, so for rationally connected variety, over in any algebraically closed field, Chow zero is just z. But over fields that are not algebraically closed, uh, you, some torsion can appear in Chow zero. Um, and that's, that's what's going into this argument. Some, um, even in characteristic zero, Chow zero hypersurfaces, uh, some, some two torsion is there. And one way to prove that it's there is by this reducing to characteristic two. Let's see. Um, so the proof of the lemma, I mean, this is a, actually pretty much a standard kind of argument in the theory of algebraic cycles. Um, so let's say this is, uh, let's say, a variant of um, Bloch and Trinivas' argument, which I guess Claire alluded to. Um, so uh, yes. Um, so how would I put this? So. Uh, so, so maybe just, just uh, for sort of reassurance, I would like to mention a couple of equivalent interpretations of what, what this uh, property of being universally trivial means. So, so the following, let's say uh, that x is a smooth projective variety over a field. Um, um, yeah, I think I've already sort of, without intending to, used a couple of different equivalent notions, uh, and I want to say that they're all equivalent. So one, one condition you could consider is that uh, k, um, that the homomorphism from the child group of zero cycles of x over this field to child zero and x over any bigger field um, is on to all fields um, f containing k. So that's equivalent to saying that um, for every field, um, F containing K, the child group of zero cycles uh, on X over that bigger field is just Z. Um, uh, right. And then the third condition is the one which other people uh, have been writing down. Let's see. Okay. So three. Um, so we can write uh, the class of the diagonal um, in, in the Chow group of n-dimensional cycles on x cross x, where n is the dimension of this smooth projective variety. Um, the diagonal is e equal to um, x plus cross a, uh, a point or a zero cycle of degree 1 plus some error term, uh, I don't know, b, where um, uh, the first projection from, from b to x is not onto. Uh, the, yeah, sort of from the support of B to this. So B is a cycle. It could have some positive and negative coefficients, but none of those uh, pieces maps onto um, X. So, yeah. So maybe, uh, I mean, I'm not, uh, yeah. 
won't go through this, but um, it's a sort of pleasant thing because I think one is in a way a very natural sort of condition, one or two, um, but they have this weird feature that they depend on all fields over k, um, which maybe feels a bit uncomfortable. But but those things are equivalent to this condition, which is just about uh, you know what happens on x cross x over the field k. So it's just those rather abstract conditions in a way depend on just properties of a certain variety over this, this given field. OK. Um, right. So OK, so I'm trying to prove this uh, lemma that if you have some non-zero differential forms, then chow 0 of your variety is not universally trivial. So conversely, suppose that it was universally trivial. Um, so let's take a proof of the lemma. Um, suppose that chow 0 of x is universally trivial. And uh, I use the third interpretation of this thing. But by, by the way, this lemma is, is quite elementary. It's sort of um, an argument that <laughs> Bloch gave many times uh, over, over many years. But it could have no, nothing really hard about it. Given that, um, suppose that so suppose the chow 0 of x is universally trivial. So then we have such a decomposition. Um, so we have um, a decomposition as in 3. Um, and then I just need to observe that correspondences, meaning cycles on x cross x, act on differential forms. Um, okay. Okay. I guess I got to erase the statement of lemma. Okay. Okay. So the point is um, that. Correspondences um, in, in x cross x give you a natural, I think of it as a pullback map um, from uh, differential form. I think of it as from differential forms on the second copy of x to the first copy, but that's just for my own uh, uh, I prefer to think of it that way. Um, uh, so this is like alpha, upper star. Um, so, so this would be true for. For any uh, i, um, okay. And so, in in, um, in characteristic zero, this is basically uh, sort of part of Hodge theory because alpha gives you a cohomology class on x cross x. You can pull back cohomology, and and that preserves the the Hodge filtration. So, so sort of this part goes to this part. But actually, yeah, it's also true in characteristic p. Um, by uh, um, result of Michel Gros, who basically just observed that uh, there's a way to write down the class of the cycle on a variety in characteristic P in, um, so let's say, uh, a cycle in Chow upper J of x uh, gives you an element uh, in Hj of x with coefficients in omega j. And this is true sort of for any smooth variety over a field. Um, so I mean. It's maybe a little bit counterintuitive that this is true even for non-compact varieties, because um, Durham cohomology on non-compact varieties in characteristic P can seem a bit uh, exotic. It can be infinite dimensional sometimes. But you know, nonetheless, just somehow imitating the usual construction, you can just write down this map. Um, and Gro did it. Um, yeah, so, so just sort of taking your, a given cycle on x cross x, you know, gives you a class like this on the product, and it's just easy to see that that gives you a map, uh, a pullback map like that. OK, and that basically does it, because you then you just think about what this would tell you about pulling back differential forms. I mean, I'll just say this in words. So, so delta would give you the identity map when you pull back differential forms. But each of these two pieces would sort of give you the zero map on pulling back differential forms in, in positive degree, um, basically because a differential form that's zero on a dense open set is obviously zero on the whole space. Yeah, so maybe I'll just leave it at that. Um, I wanted to mention one application, one other application at the end. Right. I mean, yeah. So, and again, I could emphasize that if we're in characteristic P, this is this is a vector space over K, the base field. So this is really mapped from Chow groups mod P into that space. So, um, yeah. So if, because we're doing things by reducing the characteristic two, we're really proving that there's some two torsion appearing in, in Chow groups. So 
Um, so one application, um, this is uh, so pointed out to me by um, De Fernay. Um, so, so you could ask um, sort of how rationality behaves in families, and not a lot is, is known about that. So there's this, uh, this example that um, Claire pointed out that, um, say, you know, uh, smooth cubic surface, um, think of this so over C, uh, can uh, degenerate. Um, you can write down a family of such things where the, the special fiber is, is a cone over an elliptic curve. Um, And what's the point of this pointing this out? Well, the thing is that these varieties, the general fiber is rational. And, and this is not rational because when you blow up the singular point, this is birational. This becomes a P1 bundle over an elliptic curve. That's birational to P1 times an elliptic curve. And that is definitely not rational. So this is sort of counterintuitive because you would think that varieties, I don't know, they should become more special when you specialize. You know? So, so this is sort of counterintuitive, but you can argue that this is happening because the singularity here is, is kind of bad. This is a log canonical um, singularity, but not, uh, but not canonical, say, or not KLT. Um, so yeah, you could ask what happens for families. Uh, so let's say, does rationality specialize um, for more mild singularities? You have a family of varieties where, where most of the varieties in the family um, are rational. Is it true that every fiber is rational, provided that the, um, the singularities in the, in the limit are, are not too bad, are better than that, for example? OK. And so in a way, uh, we're going to see that the answer is no. Um, let's see. Um, indeed, yeah. So, okay, so that's uh, basically the question that is open. Let's get this right. Um, so, so that is um, an open question um, if all fibers are smooth. Um, so, also, um, the answer is yes. Rationality does specialize, so to speak. Um, if the dimension uh, of the varieties in the family is at most three, and um, all fibers are KLT. Um, this is our um, a result by Defernay and uh, Fusi. Right. But somehow, um, in higher dimensions, uh, that goes wrong. So let's get this statement. Um, so for any um, number m, at least five, which is going to be the dimension of the varieties in our family, um, there is um, a family of uh, varieties of dimension m, a family just parameterized by the affine line, um, where, let's see, um, where all fibers um, over the affine line minus 0 are smooth and rational varieties. Um, and the special fiber um, has terminal singularities and is not rational. Um, so terminal singularities is about as nice as you can get um, and, and not, being, not being smooth. Um, but yeah, so in the, even in the world of terminal singularities, uh, a limit of rational varieties need not be rational. Um, OK, so let me just. Give that uh, construction. Um, it just yeah. okay. So proof. Ah, sorry, I'm gonna go late, but that would be it. Um, let's see. Um, so yeah. So this is a, a basic source of this degeneration is very uh, standard one. So for any um, any variety uh, x in, embedded in some projective space. Um, let's see. Uh, so let's say x degenerates to the cone over hyperplane section of x. Um, the 
the uh, projective cone over um, a hyperplane section um, x intersect h. Uh, and this is a very easy, well-known degeneration to write down. How do you prove it? You just you consider the projective cone over x itself. Um, and then you, you imagine cutting this thing with varying hyperplanes. So if you intersect this with a general hyperplane, you get a copy of x. So that gives you sort of family varieties where most of the varieties are just the same as x. But then when this hyperplane becomes, goes through the, uh, the cone point there, um, that intersection is, it's not x. It, it's, in fact, the projective cone over x intersect h. Uh, Janos often tells us to, to worry about the non-reduced points in this intersection, but I will not uh, worry about that. Okay. Um, so that's the degeneration, and um, I just apply this with x equals projective space. So you know, in this case, not only are the fibers smooth rational varieties, they are actually projective space. Uh, right. So, so Pn degenerates to um, a cone over um, the projective cone over um, a hypersurface of degree. Um, what do I want to say? Um, say n minus one in Pn. Um, and uh, yeah, so sort of what what uh, I'm saying is that sort of for n at least five, um, this projective cone um, it, uh, is not rational because this hypersurface is not stably rational. Mm. A hypersurface, say uh, S or something. Um, so here, it's, it's it's crucial to know that there are some. For this argument, what you need is that there are some final hypersurfaces um, that are are not even stably rational, because uh, it wasn't enough to know that they were rational. You have to deal with this projective cone over S. Um, but the fiber, you know. Uh, but uh, this the the, the uh, cone over S uh, under this degree assumption has terminal singularities. <laughs> OK, thank you. Are there any questions? Can you talk about weighted TNs? <laughs> uh, to, to what end? Oh, of course. I mean, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, well, right. I mean, so certainly people should probably apply this to uh, do other sorts of varieties and just see what you get, like complete intersections or instead of hypersurfaces. Uh, yeah, just a matter of time, I guess, before people do that. Oh, but maybe I'll just make one other point. Uh, it sort of, um, for, for this kind of argument, even to do this in characteristic zero, there's no obvious uh, limit on well, what degrees this is going to work for. So, uh, you know, it's quite possible that this will prove that hyperservices of, you know, much lower degree than we know now are, are not stably rational. You know, maybe even degree four or something. I, I doubt that this method by itself is enough to ever handle cubics. But it could get, a, you know, there's absolutely no reason why it should stop where it does now. So if you compute the forms on the double covers that you get, yeah, you yeah. get a better bound? Or do you expect to get a better one this way? Uh, for these particular ones, I mean, you'd have to be really lucky for that to happen. On the other hand, nobody has, has checked, like, well, what are the differential forms of degree less than n minus 1? So, you know, it's, somebody should probably do it and see if you get lucky. Right. You might get a better result than people know. Oh, maybe, yeah, and sort of one other sort of cute thing to mention is that there is some sort of relation between the different sort of invariants that are uh, in play here. The sort of two torsion in H3 is somehow related. Uh, this is what's called piatic Hodge theory. It's related to things like, um, say, differential forms um, on the reduction of your variety to characteristic uh, two. So I'm imagining here X is some complex variety, you know, but if it sort of reduces to something in characteristic two, then you know these two groups, which look rather different. I mean, they both sort of are vector spaces over a field of characteristic two, and and there is some relation between them. Um, so somehow Arden Mumford's invariant is very similar to the kind of invariants that come up from from Kolar's examples. Um, but nobody, <laughs> this is just a vague idea at the moment, I guess. But there is yeah, these these two methods are, are have a lot in common. Say again. Oh, maybe three. That's what I wrote there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. 
Any other questions? Um,